Welcome back, or if you are just tuning in for the first time, thank you for joining me for this fourth pre-concert lecture video for the 2022 Bellingham Festival of Music. My name is Ryan Dudenbostel. Along with the overture to Mozart's final opera, The Magic Flute, and the last of Johannes Brahms' four symphonies, tonight's program features five lieder, or songs in German, by Richard Strauss, composed over a span of just over 20 years, from 1897 to 1918, though he wrote more than 200 over the course of his long life. The lead, which is the singular form of leader, is among the most important genres in 19th century German music. But it's something we don't get to talk about very often in the context of orchestral programs. So that is exactly what we are going to talk about today the art of the lead. Now, songs, meaning poetic words paired with music, have been around as long as there's been music. And this is as true in the German-speaking world as it is anywhere. But in art music circles, art music being music that doesn't serve any other purpose other than just being listened to, in art music circles, songs or lieder never held the kind of prestige enjoyed by opera, or the string quartet, or the solo sonata, and so on. Lieder were typically written by lesser composers for public consumption and at-home performances by amateurs. But that all began to change in the decade between 1810 and 1820, when a teenage Franz Schubert began pouring out Lieder by the hundreds. Suddenly, almost overnight, the lead became the hottest thing since bratwurst and sauerkraut, and suddenly everyone was writing them. Schubert's leader really established the model, followed by all later German composers of leader, and we'll talk about why they're so great in a few minutes. But it wasn't just Schubert's brilliance that put the lead in the spotlight. He came at a pivotal cultural moment that was fueled by a number of different but interrelated historical trends. First, as I've talked about before, the turn of the 19th century saw the crumbling of the old power structures. The twin pillars of political power, the aristocracy and the church, were fast losing their grips on the hearts and minds of an ever more educated public. And with their faith shaken, many people turned to art to fill in the spiritual gap. In the early 19th century, the artist becomes sort of a Promethean figure, the bringer of fire from God to man, but misunderstood and rejected by society. This is the tortured artist trope, of course, which flourished then and continues to resonate today. Romantic art and literature is full of lone heroes in conflict with outer forces. This focus on the individual rather than the collective is one of the most striking differences between 18th and 19th century art. Just compare the brotherhood of man Schiller describes in his Ode to Joy to almost any text from a Schubert song. We also see a paradoxical excitement for the future and novelty alongside a deep nostalgia for the past. If you think about it, the experience of someone walking out their front door in 1450 would be just about the same as it would be in 1750. But in the 1800s, industrialization was bringing dramatic new changes to everyday life on a daily basis. Sanitation, mass production, the steam engine, the telegraph, photography, electricity, and on and on. In two generations, Europe went from being a feudal society to a modern one. And with these developments in science and technology, it seemed as if man had conquered nature. And of course, all of that came with a cost, with forests cleared, urban air full of soot, and the quiet sounds of the countryside replaced by the roaring of the locomotive. And it all happened so fast that even young artists had a deep sense of grief over the lost world of their childhoods. Related to all of this, we see a huge surge of interest in folk art, 
Folk traditions and tropes were seen as authentic and pure and without pretense, and also intimately connected to the world of the past. Folk traditions also tend to be superstitious, so we find a renewed interest in the supernatural, particularly in German-speaking areas. Now, European royalty were all related to one another, and a Catholic mass was the same in Vienna as it was in Paris, but folk traditions are localized. So alongside this reverence for the folk, we also see a rejection of Enlightenment-era internationalism in favor of romantic nationalism. And it all boils down to a new value of place and the cultural traditions native to that place. This is a trend all over Europe, but is especially fervent in areas on the fringes of imperial rule, like Hungary and Bohemia. And a final factor was just one person, Beethoven. Or to be specific, Beethoven's symphonies. It's really impossible to exaggerate the sway these pieces held over the 19th century. The general attitude was that they were as good as a symphony could get. So good luck trying to even match their quality. Gone were the days of Mozart or Haydn writing dozens or even hundreds of symphonies without a care in the world. Now composers who attempted a symphony slaved over it, feeling Beethoven's shadow looming over every note. Many others just avoided writing symphonies altogether. Now in the context of all that, let's talk about the romantic lead cultivated by Schubert. These were songs set to pre-existing text by German poets, some famous, some not. So the words come first and the music comes second. They are typically strophic in form, meaning there's one tune or verse that repeats multiple times with different texts. The poems almost always depict nature or rural life. We really don't find any leader dealing with urban life at all. And usually the speaker in the poems either longs for love, is in the throes of love, or is grieving lost love, or all three within the course of one poem. Um, or the poem might concern the supernatural, ghosts or elves or witches, that sort of thing. It's really the perfect genre for its time. It's nationalistic, in the language of the audience, based on poetry and folk idioms they would recognize, appealing to their nostalgia, and not a symphony. And it was Schubert who single-handedly raised the lead to a true art form. He had this masterful understanding of the emotional world of the text and could paint that in music with extraordinary depth and clarity. Oftentimes his piano textures evoke the babbling of a stream or the rushing of leaves or other ambient sounds occurring in the world of the poem. Here are a few examples. One of his early famous songs is called uh, Gretchen am Spinrade, which is Gretchen at the Spinning Wheel. Uh, this is taken from Goethe's Faust. And the, the piano writing is, is quite virtuosic because it depicts both the spinning of the needle, yeah, both the spinning of the needle, and the pumping of the treadle together through the whole song. And the, the rapid motion here of the spinning wheel depicts Gretchen's anxiety and uh, creates a terrific contrast with the slow rhythm of the vocal line. Another example, this was written a year later when Schubert was um, an old man of 17, is the Erlkönig which is the story of uh, the elf king, a supernatural character who comes and steals children in the night. This is an extraordinary piece for a number of reasons. Um, number one, it has four different characters. There's a narrator, there's uh, a father riding a horse, there's his son who's with him, and then there's the Erlkönig himself. And these are all depicted in different vocal ranges and with different accompaniments, but all by one singer. So it's kind of like a mini opera sung by one person. But what I wanted to share with you is that kind of like Gretchen am Spinrade, uh, the Erlkönig 
is underpinned by this galloping motion of the horse. <laughs> exhausting to play, and uh, I, many pianists I know refuse to perform it. Now, as we've talked about, the emotion of nostalgia is sort of a common thread through most of these texts. And nostalgia is a unique emotion in that it exists both in the past, we're grateful that something happened, and the present, we're sad that it's over. And Schubert often portrays this using two different keys, one to represent then, one to represent now. Here's a song. Uh, also from 1815, called Erster Verlust, or First Loss. And the text, I'll just play and sing the ending for you. Forgive my German. The text is, Oh, who will bring back the beautiful days, that delightful time. And the, the time of the present is represented using this key, F minor. And the past is A flat major. And these two keys are what we call relative majors and minors of each other, meaning that they come from the same scale. So that it's very easy to slip between them. And Schubert does exactly that. It's hard to know sometimes what key we're in, whether we're in the key of F minor or A flat major. So here's just the end of the song. This song to me is so evocative in that the last sung words, Zeit zu Ruch, the beautiful days, Zeit zu Ruch, end in the memory of the key of then, but then we are thrown back into the grief of now to end the song. These are devices that are used in all of Schubert's leader and really all leader that follow. And these themes of the pastoral world of nostalgia, of love about to happen, happening, lost, or all in between, really continue in this long thread from Schubert through Schumann through Brahms and on to Strauss. So there is the art of the lead. I hope this gives you some insight into the world that Richard Strauss is entering into in his own leader, which we'll hear this evening. Thank you so much for being with me for this pre-concert lecture. I look forward to seeing and talking with you next time. Enjoy the program.